Thank you for joining Reading Horizons today for our webcast. We're excited to have Donnell Pons, Literacy Coordinator at American International School of Utah, and all of you with us today. After Donnell's filmed presentation, she will be here in the office for a live question and answer, so be sure to add any questions you've had throughout the presentation into the chat section. Also, if you've not officially registered for this presentation, be sure to take a moment at readhorizons.com slash webcast. We will be sending a link to the final recording to registrants, and you'll be able to download the slide deck from the presentation and request a certificate of attendance. And now we are pleased to present Donnell Pons and her presentation, Dyslexia, What Every Educator Should Know. Uh, before I begin, I want to thank everyone who is joining us for this webcast, Dyslexia, What Every Educator Should Know. My name is Donnell Pons, and I appreciate the time you've taken from your busy schedules. Let me reassure you that there is nothing more valuable you can do right now than find out more about dyslexia. Whatever time you devote to this subject has the potential to change the lives and experiences for your students in school. I also want to let you know that since there were so many fantastic questions, we've decided to do a second part to this webcast. The second part will go into detail about 504s, IEPs, and appropriate classroom accommodations for students with dyslexia. That's a huge subject in itself. Before I begin, I want to give a little bit of my history because for me, dyslexia is personal. My husband and son both have dyslexia. And I had no idea what dyslexia was when I realized my husband and son had the same language challenge. And in the case of my husband, I discovered this reading challenge while on our honeymoon. We were actually camping at the base of the Teton Mountains and had decided to buy a book that we could read in the tent that night. And that night while in the tent, I began to read and then pass the book to my husband to share the reading duties, and he struggled to find fluency. He dropped words, substituted common words, and skipped whole lines. And I tried to hide my shock. I couldn't believe, is this the same guy that's on the dean's list in college? And why was reading so challenging for him? And through the years, my husband and I, we worked on a homemade kind of plan of remediation, um, looking at the things that were happening for him, looking at specific words, making sure he saw every letter and, and made the sounds. And then he also began to practice at home with our young kids as they were growing older and getting, having their reading experience. My husband started with those young reader books with our children and went with them through the readers. And this seemed to help. It really improved my husband's reading. What I didn't realize is that dyslexia is inherited. It's genetic. And so I was going to have children a 50-50 chance that they would have dyslexia as well. And sure enough, uh, when my, son, my first son was born, he read just fine. But my daughter, she struggled. And thankfully, we had in second grade a great teacher who was being mentored by a reading specialist. And they devised a plan and had my daughter in small group reading. And pretty soon, she was able to read and doing just fine. Unfortunately, they didn't share with me what they were doing or what they had seen because I didn't know to be looking for my other children. And by the time I had my youngest, he had a really good case of dyslexia. And by the time he was in kindergarten, he was already behind. He knew that he was different. He wasn't getting the sounds. He wasn't getting the letters. He struggled to write his own name, which should have been easy for him. And what's really hard is because they're so aware, they know they're different. Students with dyslexia know they are different. And this thing that everyone else seems to be doing with such ease that's so hard for them makes being in the classroom unbearable for these kids. And that's how it was for my son. And then he moved on to first grade, still struggling. And then by second grade, I was begging for help from his second grade teacher, please help me. And then eventually, because I didn't find the help that I needed, I went back to school and earned dual master's degrees and a certification in special education, all of it, to get at the heart of why teaching children with reading challenges is so hard in our schools and why there is an insurmountable amount of opposition sometimes to getting that job done when it is the basic skill for all of our students. And I've also read countless articles, hundreds of books. There's a load of information out there. And all of this I've done on my own because I've found that there really isn't a great clearinghouse for this information. There's a lot out there and even more available today. But how do we as educators, as parents, as administrators, wade through all of that information to get the most valuable information and apply it to our schools? I also began to teach uh, in this experience in a middle school out in a, a challenging area in my neighborhood. And I had a lot of students who were not reading on grade level. I was teaching seventh grade English. And I realized that most of my students, in fact, were reading near a second to third grade reading level. And there was no plan to help these students. I was going to do my best with them for a year and pass them on to eighth grade. That did not seem like a good solution to me. And we know it's not a good solution. Um, now, I am the literacy coordinator at the American International School of Utah, known as AISU. 
We're a public charter school and we have approximately 1,300 students from kindergarten to 12th grade, including almost 60 international students from Southeast Asia to South America. And what I'm going to be discussing today, we actually are implementing here in our K through 12 with teachers and paraprofessionals. Uh, before I begin though with some of the solutions, we're going to have a, a, a rather lengthy discussion about what dyslexia is because there's a lot of misinformation out there. And again, your great questions helped us uh, come up with the information we're providing today. I'm going to begin first with some pre, uh, dyslexia statistics. They're startling. And I'm not doing this to shock anybody because I think we're all quite aware of what they are. But it does kind of bring us into a focus what it is we're talking about today. First, roughly one in five students struggles with dyslexia. And this translates to approximately 8.5 million American school children. In an average class of 25 students, approximately five will have characteristics of dyslexia. And about 70 to 80% of students receiving services in special education that are classified with a learning disability or specific learning disability have dyslexia. And in an Education Week article from 2011, the magazine highlighted a report by sociology professor Donald Hernandez who compared reading scores and graduation rates of almost 4,000 students. Quote, a student who can't read on grade level by third grade is four times less likely to graduate by age 19 than a child who does read proficiently by that time. Add poverty to the mix and a student is 13 times less likely to graduate on time than his or her proficient, wealthier peer, close quote. And although it has become a popular anecdotal story, the idea that some states look at third grade reading scores to plan for prison beds is simply not true. However, when researching the correlation between dropout rates and reading scores, and then looking further at dropout rates in prison populations, it would seem like pretty reliable data for prison planning. And while the prevalence of dyslexia in the general population is about 20%, the prevalence of dyslexia in prisoners is more than twice that or 48% according to a scientific study conducted at the University of Texas Medical Branch in conjunction with the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. And according to the National Assessment of Educational Progress, or NAEP, report for 2015, only 37% of graduating high school students scored at or above the proficient reading level. Furthermore, this low level of reading proficiency was not significantly different from the results for 2013. Okay, so if we didn't need any convincing, we now are convinced reading in the United States, teaching reading and our students being able to read on grade level is a problem for us. Now, dyslexia is the most common, as we said, and most carefully studied of the learning disabilities, affecting 80 to 90% of all individuals identified as learning disabled. And of the learning disabilities, dyslexia is also the best characterized and the oldest. In fact, the first description of dyslexia preceded the first mention of learning disability by over 60 years. Dyslexia was first reported by British physician, Dr. Pringle Morgan in 1896, and he was describing Percy F. And he says, he has always been a bright and intelligent boy, quick at games, and in no way inferior to others of his age. His great difficulty has been, and is now, his inability to learn to read. A description that characterizes the boys and girls, men and women who have dyslexia today. And in 1925, an American neurologist, Dr. Samuel T. Orton, proposed the first theory of how specific reading difficulties arose and he placed a great emphasis on the dominance of one side of the brain. This is way back in 1925. And teaching strategies he developed along with Dr. Anna Gillingham during his research are still in use today. This understanding called Orton Gilliam or OG based reading instruction is multi-sensory, structured, sequential, cumulative, cognitive, and flexible. And it employs visual, auditory, tactile, and kinesthetic techniques to teach the language of sounds, the phoneme or phonemic awareness and many popular reading programs use this same methodology today. So as I said, there are many programs available. And although the methodology developed to help students with dyslexia learn to read was developed decades ago, science has continued to explore the origin of this reading challenge until most recently, within the last 10 to 15 years, there has been an absolute explosion of neuroscience. And this information has led to a greater understanding of how to find and teach students with dyslexia. We now have a more accurate definition of developmental dyslexia defined as an unexpected difficulty in reading in children and adults who otherwise possess the intelligence and motivation considered necessary for accurate and fluent reading and who also have had reasonable reading instruction. So that's your garden variety definition today. As this definition indicates, there is a fundamental difference in students who struggle to read and that difference is found in the brain. Referring to Dr. Sally Shaywitz with the Yale Center for Dyslexia and Creativity, 
there is an abundance of some of the most straightforward brain research on dyslexia, and a range of studies have converged to demonstrate three neural systems that are used for reading. These three neural systems are located in the brain's left hemisphere. The first is in the inferior frontal gyrus, which is believed to support articulation and word analysis functions. The other two neural systems are located further back in the posterior area of the brain, one in the periototemporal area or region, also for word analysis, and a second in the occipitotemporal region, which is believed to allow for rapid, automatic, and fluent identification of words. So brain imaging investigations further demonstrate differences in activation patterns between good and struggling readers of all ages. Non-impaired younger children demonstrate significantly greater activation in the three left hemisphere neural systems than do dyslexic children. In other words, we have more information available to us than ever before in regards to dyslexia and why reading is so hard for some of our students. Armed with this scientifically based research, there is absolutely no reason why we can't make reading skills happen for most of our dyslexic students. So that's your takeaway. We can make a difference. As mentioned before, Dr. Sally Shaywitz has been one of the many brilliant researchers leading the charge to identify students with dyslexia and then teach these students appropriately. In one of her recent appearances before a legislative committee, this time the Committee on Space, Science and Technology in the House of Representatives on September 18, 2014, she said, and I'm going to read you from this because I keep a copy of this on my desk. If you have anybody question you at your school, please have a copy of this and the next one I'll tell you to have a copy of too. I show this to people at my school. She says, as you will hear, in dyslexia, science has moved forward at a rapid pace so that we now possess the data to reliably define dyslexia, to know its prevalence, its cognitive basis, its symptoms, and remarkably where it lives in the brain, and evidence-based interventions which can turn a sad, struggling child into not only a good reader, but one who sees herself as a student with self-esteem and a fulfilling future. Anyone questions you on dyslexia, please use that quote. To see a full explanation of the brain science Dr. Shaywitz is referring to, you can visit the Yale Center for Dyslexia and Creativity on their website and look under Research and Science. And for an excellent introduction that includes the research, plus a background, you can see Dr. Shally Shaywitz's book, Overcoming Dyslexia, and it's a good place to start. Now, dyslexia is considered a medical condition, and because it is neurobiological in nature, in many states, this is part of the confusion, because a medical doctor is able to diagnose dyslexia, but most doctors have little or no training in dyslexia and reading disabilities and will depend on evaluation results provided by the school. So many states allow diagnosis by a neuropsychologist even though these professionals are not medical doctors. And this becomes a catch-22 because in the past, schools were allowed to evaluate and classify children with a specific learning disability, but now are prohibited from evaluating for dyslexia. And in my 14 years as an educator, I have not seen one IEP with an official diagnosis of dyslexia done by a school. They all come from outside. And this is an expensive process, one that makes it impossible for most families. And the other issue is, do we really want all of these children to be identified and served in special education? And many of them won't qualify because we know they have other strengths. And at a time when resources are already limited and outcomes for children receiving reading intervention in special education are generally poor, do we want to increase this population? <laughs> so we're caught in a lot of different things here. So what can be done? First, we can start with preschool and early elementary. A number of characteristics are often observable in very young children, such as a delayed onset for talking, poor receptive or expressive vocabulary, difficulty learning the alphabet or counting, and problems recognizing or producing rhymes. As children are introduced to print, the primary difficulties may manifest in sound letter associations, that's phonics basic reading skills and automaticity and poor spelling. In the upper grades, children with dyslexia, we are now looking at deficits. They may exhibit problems with vocabulary, reading comprehension, and written expression. So in the younger student, oftentimes it looks like anxiety. The student may complain of headaches or stomach aches. They may want to leave the room. Reassess what you're doing in your classroom. Is there popcorn reading where students are being called on? Because that can be absolutely terrifying to the student who's struggling to read. Do you break into groups where everyone knows exactly what reading level the other students are on? Because that also, trust me, is a reason why students don't want to come to class. Are we putting scores on a board where everyone can see them that are related to reading? How about those weekly spelling tests every Friday? Does everyone know who's missing every word? And trust me, even if you're being careful 
about not marking up a student's paper or broadcasting the results of those tests, it is terrifying for that student with dyslexia to face a spelling test every Friday. You have no idea, I do, because I'm the mother of a student with dyslexia. Friday spelling tests are terrifying. Any, just look around the room and think of any way in which reading, approaching text, is public, is, is noticed by everybody, is on a scale of one to five, and kind of try to reassess the classroom to see what you can do to make it more approachable and more safe for the student who has dyslexia or is struggling to read. And I trust me, the behaviors will improve. Students who feel safe in your classroom will come to class and they'll spend more time in your classroom than they have probably in other classrooms. So make that a part of what you're looking at. Also, sometimes we look at aggressive behavior by a student and we, we tend to characterize that student as being overly aggressive. Try to look at that student and see if there isn't something to do with reading. A lot of these children, as we said, are just students that we're talking about have gotten into the older grades. We're starting to see them skipping classes. So check out all those behaviors that we might assume come from something else. And typically what I do when somebody says to me, I have a student who's doing this, and they talk about a behavior, the student who's not coming to class, I immediately go to reading scores. That's the first thing I look at when I'm sitting down with a teacher who's talking about a challenging student. I, every single time, I'll go right to those reading scores and say, what's the reading score of this student? Interestingly enough, most teachers say to me, reading scores, and we'll look at them, and sure enough, they're at the bottom every time. So fundamentally, that student doesn't have the skills to be successful in that classroom. And that's really what these behaviors are about. So they're directly linked. Also remember that when you remediate a student with dyslexia, the co-attending behaviors disappear. It's one of the only learning disabilities where behavior disappears once the, ch the student's educational challenge is remediated. We can't say that of a lot of other things, but we can say that about dyslexia, which is really interesting. And that's fascinating research if you want to look at it. And also know that dyslexia is influenced by heredity. So studies indicate that 60% of children with a family member who has dyslexia will also develop dyslexia. So family history is important. Not only are we seeing things that are manifest in the classroom that should alert us to a student having dyslexia, but then also family members and their family history is important to this. And since we have everything we need to find, assess, and teach students with dyslexia, we're not waiting for more hard evidence. We have plenty of hard evidence. So what's stopping us? The first is that lack of training for teachers. When a teacher enters the field after receiving a degree in education, it is likely that they have had limited coursework in reading instruction. And in addition, most postgraduate education programs or special education masters do not include comprehensive assessment, instruction, or intervention strategies in reading for dyslexics. Is there any wonder why reading scores are so low and why many children in special education do not make significant progress? Next. Not only do we need schools across the country, including state and district level administrators, to actively engage in reading about and becoming educated in the language of reading and remediation, but we also need university and alternative route to teacher licensure programs to make dyslexia education a singular and non-negotiable part of their programs. There are no excuses left, absolutely no excuses left for teacher certification programs not to include or to ignore the obvious that dyslexia exists and there are sound screening and assessing programs available with equally sound reading remediation programs. Every teacher, regardless of the subject you teach, will need to have some understanding of dyslexia. And every reading specialist or K-3 through teacher in the classroom teaching students will need to have a solid understanding of dyslexia. I'm assuming that you already know this and that's why you've joined us today and there is so much that can be done. For administrators and teachers who are already in the field of education, it's now your responsibility to become familiar enough with dyslexia to make important decisions for your school. If you need professional development and you want to seek it out, call your local chapter of Decoding Dyslexia. Watch a video on the International Dyslexia Association website. As you are beginning to plan for summer training and next year's professional development, make dyslexia a priority. Bring in someone to do that professional development for you. And we're going to be talking a little bit here about the assessments of children with dyslexia and the deficits that they show in these patterns. I want to be clear here that when our students are young, as Dr. Sally Shaywitz has made reference to, and we will again later in the broadcast, when our students are young, there is a lot more that we can do. It is much easier to intervene on students who are younger, and that's why we emphasize those younger grades. But we also have to realize there are so many students who have made it into the upper grades and who will continue to make it into the upper grades, who will need help and can receive help and can become better readers with appropriate remediation. These students will exhibit deficits now. They are at risk when you're younger, 
when you're older you now have deficits because you didn't receive the help that you needed. So there are, are many ways of identifying students and helping them. So one of the things we're going to see in the younger students are they're going to have difficulty with letter sound knowledge and the phonological awareness, the inability to identify letters and their sounds and to manipulate the individual units of speech such as the initial, the middle, and the ending sounds in a word. So remember, phonemic awareness is the sounds without the letters. So anytime you manipulate a sound, a word, take the first, the middle, the end sound, that's phonemic awareness. Rhyming is also a part of that, knowing what words rhyme just by hearing them. It's being able to drop the first sound off of a word and add a different one. So if you give the student the word shop, tell them to drop the sh sound and put in m, could they do it? Could they put, make it mop? That sort of a thing. Now when you introduce the letters, that's phonics, when you're putting a sound to a letter. And when those letters are, are used differently within a word and make different sounds and there's combinations of letters, all of that is phonics and having a good foundation for phonics. They also have difficulty with rapid, automized naming, or RAN. It's the inability to rapidly recall and name familiar items such as letters, numbers, and colors. They also have difficulty with processing speed and working memory inability to focus attention to complete tasks and hold new information in short-term memory and manipulate it to achieve a result. Fortunately, fMRI research has led to an important finding. Because of that plasticity that I was talking about of the brain, dyslexic children who were screened early and received appropriate interventions showed brain scans that resembled those of children without reading difficulties. Okay, if you take nothing else away, I hope you understand that. If you get in early and remediate these students, their brains actually look like the other readers in the classroom who do not have dyslexia. That's huge. This means that identifying young children and providing the right kinds of targeted instruction may actually prevent reading failure and the need for later intervention. That's huge and not something we've done a lot with. Because dyslexia does not look the same in every person, it's important that parents, educators, and pediatricians have an understanding of the dyslexia continuum from mild to severe. Dyslexia occurs in people of all intellectual levels, as I told you, my bright and intelligent husband had no idea that he was struggling to read. And many people with dyslexia are gifted, making them twice exceptional and more easily overlooked. Dyslexia can also coexist with ADD and ADHD, dysgraphia and dyscalculia, and executive functioning difficulties. For some people with dyslexia, spoken language is also impacted, and these factors make appropriate screening all the more necessary. So remember, it is inherited, so ask parents and guardians about their family learning history, Students with dyslexia, I want to get a few things straight too, don't see things backward. The challenge is in how they process the language patterns they do see. And it is the only learning disability that can be remediated with high quality instruction, as we've said before. There are well-researched, scientifically-based methods for helping students with dyslexia learn to read with fluency and accuracy. And for a quick resource guide to learn more about the nature of dyslexia, you can read Basic Facts About Dyslexia and Other Reading Problems by Louisa Cook Motes and Karen E. Dakin published by the International Dyslexia Association. This is an affordable book. It's one that you could purchase several copies for your school. Okay, so now we're armed with a comprehensive definition of dyslexia and a basic understanding of the brain science. What does dyslexia look like in our classrooms? Well, signs of dyslexia are a little different given the age of the student, as we've said. So when you're at grade level, um, it can often be challenging for teachers to find that when the kids are younger, even though it gets easier as you're more aware. But say a fifth grade student who forgets the vowels in common words or even in his or her own name, that is not typical. The 10th grade student who spells that t instead of T-H-A-T as T-A-T and leaves out the H, or spells phonetically even the most common words like the as T-H-A. And that is something that should tip you off. Instead of saying, isn't that unusual, or saying, geez, that student's being lazy, that is not what this is about. As a student gets older, trust me, they have no intention of making a mistake like that. This is because they're struggling. The fourth grade student who drops simple words like a, uh, and, the, and skips whole lines, or substitutes similar looking words, or puts in another name for the same word, like saying shop for the word market. It could be an eighth grade student who can't hang on to the difference between miss, missus, or mister, and they'll get those confused, no matter how many times he or she has seen those words pointed out to them. And any student who is struggling to read despite being described as otherwise very bright by teachers should be looked at. As early as preschool, it's the student who can't remember the letters of the alphabet or the sounds they make no matter how many times it's taught. That is unusual and it needs to tip us off to something. For a full list of characteristics, you can go to a number of websites. They're all free. There's one, uh, Susan Barton's Bright Solutions for Dyslexia and that Yale Center for Dyslexia and Creativity. 
and the International Dyslexia Association, just to name a few. Schools aren't vision or hearing centers. I want you to wrap your head around this because we see it happen at the beginning of every school year in a lot of districts. They are institutions of learning, yet they screen for vision and hearing problems while completely ignoring screening for the most common learning disability. And this has to change. I mean, just think about it, the time we spend doing that alone. Dyslexia screening is considered a tool in identifying students who may be at risk for dyslexia in the lower grades. But remember, by the upper grades, we're really looking at dyslexia and students who now have deficits and characteristics of students with dyslexia. While the brain is young and still developing language and before bad habits are formed, remediation takes far less time and effort as I mentioned before. And if you want to see a really good video on this that explains it very well, there's one by Dr. Patricia Matthies from Southern Methodist University. She recently released a video that can be viewed on the International Dyslexia website for free. And the video is called Curing Dyslexia, What is Possible? Dr. Matthies provides research-based studies showing just how important early screening and remediation is for dyslexic students. To the point, the students who are screened and then receive appropriate reading intervention never show the profile of a dyslexic student with the labored eye reading, labored sound processing, etc. This video should be seen by everyone, administrator, educator, parent, state legislator, school board member, everyone should see this video. And currently there is no universal screening method for dyslexia. So as common as it is, there is no actual universal screening method. However, there are a lot of tests and a lot of um, assessments that we give in schools right now that if we knew what to look for would provide a lot of information for us. So screening is a must and if we are really interested in improving reading outcomes in this country we will have to implement and encourage early dyslexia screening supported by strong reading interventions that states are willing to fund. So as it stands anyone who is interested in screening you're going to need to make sure you're well versed in the rules and regulations surrounding dyslexia in your particular state and district and also you'll want to make sure that you have a handle on um, the regulations regarding when you screen for students. And so this is for administrators and educators and parents. If you really want help in being able to screen, there are lots of good books, and I'll mention a few uh, here up, coming up in the webcast. Um, in the most recent issue of Perspectives on Language and Literacy, Yeoman and Mather report that as of December 2015, 28 states had statewide dyslexia laws, six states had initiatives or resolutions related to dyslexia, and 14 states had handbooks or resource guides to inform parents and educators about proper procedures for students in the public and private educational settings. After you've become versed in the laws regulating dyslexia screening and assessing, work with the administration at your school to develop a plan for implementing a screening process. There are several very good books to guide this process, and one is Dyslexia Screening, Essential Concepts for Schools and Parents by Richard Selznick. He outlines a very approachable process that walks a school through forming a professional development team to assess the screening process and recommends using many of the testing materials that are already existing in the school such as dibbles as part of a battery of tests that could form the initial investigation. And one of the things that we used here at AISU were our dibbles results. So as a lot of schools in our district have done, you'll take an, a beginning of the year assessment. And based off of that, in our kindergarten grades, we saw that half of our students were in the red, what is considered red, on the dibbles test. And from that information, we went further and decided to offer some more additional testing with the program that we're using, and then look at that data to decide who would go into small group uh, remediation. And so as a result, we took nearly half our kindergartners and put them into small group settings to be able to work on those basic and initial skills for reading or reading preparedness. Um, and we would not have found those students had we not been looking and then had a plan to implement in order to get those students into small group setting. Some of those students have already received some instruction and been moved out of small group setting because all they needed was some additional time. And some of those students are staying in small group setting and an additional set of those students will continue on in small group because these students may continue to need support as they go along. They're students who are really going to need intervention. But as you can see, when you know what you're looking for and you have a system in place to help those students, you can actually be grabbing students at different levels and have some of them even avoid additional reading help should they just get it early enough uh, when you're screening. So a screener does a lot of things. It doesn't just help the student with dyslexia but it helps a lot of your readers who may have struggled unnecessarily from lack of instruction or lack of understanding at a particular point in their uh, reading instruction. Uh, so we can see a lot of benefits for it across the board. Another really good book for the screening process is Basic Facts About Assessment of Dyslexia, Testing for Teaching by Susan Lowell and Rebecca Felton and Pamela Hook. Um, it's also published by the International Dyslexia Association. There's another fantastic book, Essentials of Dyslexia Assessment Intervention by Nancy Mather and Barbara Wendling. 
And it's worth noting that although I haven't used the assessment, I've watched a webcast introducing Dr. Sally Shaywitz's dyslexia screener, and it's available through Pearson. Uh, Susan Barton also has a process for screening for dyslexia. I attended her week-long training and found it to be extremely valuable and comprehensive. And you can find information regarding this training on her website at Bright Solutions. Now, once you've screened, if you're able to screen, and what do you do now with the results? So as I told you, what we did is we took those students after we had screened and looked at the data, compared it with other data, ran additional testing if needed to support what we had seen or to gather further information, and put those students into small group. This process was not that challenging. It took maybe a matter of a week and a half to decide on the groups, and then we had a good support system for our students. And this is where a team of literacy people is important because it can support your efforts. Many of the people at my school had to be trained. So we began with some basic and fundamental training. And of course, the longer you work with students, the more you understand. Um, many students may end up needing an official dyslexia diagnosis. And this may arise if the student appears to have a more severe case of dyslexia or if the parents would like more official testing. As we talked about before, uh, we'll give more information on the IEP 504 process. But appropriate testing for students uh, in the diagnosis, there's some key federal legislation that we should be aware of as an educator. There are many state legislative challenges when screening, assessing, and diagnosing students with dyslexia. In Utah, only qualified school psychologists and neuropsychologists are allowed to assess students for dyslexia. We also have no uniform screening process. So you need to check with your local chapter, again, of Decoding Dyslexia to find out more about your state rules and regulations. That's a good place to start regarding screening and assessing students with dyslexia. There have been two key pieces of federal legislation action that you should be aware of when discussing students with dyslexia. And remember, I keep copies of these. This is another one to keep a copy of. It's a document that you should familiarize yourself with, and it's the U.S. Department of Education Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services document. That's a mouthful. It was signed on October 23, 2015. This document states clearly that dyslexia does exist, and the term should be used during IEP meetings and when referencing students with the condition. And I'll quote from the document because it's very, very specific. It says, I write today to focus particularly on the unique educational needs of children with dyslexia, dyscalculia, and dysgraphia, he mentions all three, which are conditions that could qualify a student as a child with a specific learning disability under the Individuals and Dis with Disabilities Education Act. The Office of Special Education and Rehabilitation Services has received communications from stakeholders, including parents, advocacy groups and national disability organizations who believe that state and local educational agencies are reluctant to reference or use dyslexia in evaluations, eligibility determinations, or in developing the individualized education program. The purpose of this letter is to clarify that there is nothing in the IDEA that would prohibit the use of the terms dyslexia, dyscalculia, and dysgraphia in IDEA evaluations, eligibility determinations, or IEP documents. It's stated very clearly. The rest of the document is just as clear about dyslexia. And I have a stack of copies of this on my desk, and I'll share it with my colleagues, administrators, parents, anyone. It is very helpful. The other one you should be aware of is the Research, Excellence, and Advancements for Dyslexia Act, or the READ Act, which was signed February 21, 2016. President Obama signed the READ Act as a bipartisan measure that directs the National Science Foundation to set aside at least $2.5 million in its annual budget for dyslexia research with a focus on early identification of children and students, professional development for teachers and administrators, and curricula development and evidence-based educational tools. Research was mandated to begin October 2016 and will sunset September 30, 2021. So that's some very important legislation. So what can an educator do today if no one is recognizing dyslexia at your school? For now, let's deal with the reality. You may or may not have a school administrator who knows anything about dyslexia. And if you need to start educating administration, use the recent federal government letters to begin a discussion about what your school or district is going to do to help students with dyslexia. It's a great place to start. Next, find out what the state education laws are regarding finding and helping students with dyslexia in your state, just like I found out in mine. Then you try to find ways to work within those laws to help your students, and that's just what we've done here. I figured out creative ways to help students in my state. Sadly, this is the reality. You're going to have to find ways to work around some of the legislation that uh, may be prohibiting you from working with students who have dyslexia. Most often, you're going to run into state regulations that tie your hands as an educator and provide absolutely no professional development to help you know how to find students with dyslexia and then provide the appropriate services. My husband and son are some 40 years apart in age, yet their experiences with dyslexia in the school system are almost exactly alike, in that no one at the school knew what they had 
or how to test for it, and certainly had no idea how to teach them how to read. And that's simply not okay. It's not okay when we have so much scientifically-based research to guide our teaching practice. This stops today. You're watching this webcast today. You have information. You are armed with it. It stopped today at my school with me here, and it's going to stop at your school with you today. We're educators. We're professionals. We're trained, and we should continue to be trained to become experts in our fields. As a teacher, I should know what dyslexia is and is not. I should know how to test for it, and I should know how to teach students who have dyslexia. And I should know how accommodations are appropriate and have the ability to provide them. I should know how to help parents support their students with dyslexia. In short, this is my job. And it's your job as an educator, administrator, certified special education instructor, etc., to know how to help your students with dyslexia. It is the most common learning disability. I have no excuse other than my state won't recognize dyslexia or support me as an educator. But that doesn't stop me from learning more about it and from helping my own students. Can you imagine a doctor telling a cancer patient that it really doesn't matter what type of cancer you have? You'll receive the same treatment as anyone with any type of cancer. That's the best I can do. We would never accept that. Yet this is what I'm telling my students with dyslexia when I say, I have no idea what dyslexia is or how to test for it or how to help you. You can just join the rest of my class and receive the same instruction and hope for the best. Or better still, you might be one of those lucky students who actually gets testing through the special education department at the school, only to have a diagnosis of specific learning disability or learning disability and still have no clue it's dyslexia. Now, because you're so lucky, you get pulled out of your regular classes to spend time with a sped para, getting no help for dyslexia, only to miss out now on vital classroom instruction to make your instructional gap even larger. That's not okay, yet it happens all the time. And remember, we'll cover the IEP 504 process with appropriate accommodations in another webcast because they're very important. But I want you to remember, students with dyslexia may be your best storytellers. Until they receive the proper remediation for their reading and writing difficulties, look for methods to help them tell their stories. So if needed, consider ways to include a scribe, speech to text, or recorded versions of student narratives. If referral to special education results in the student with dyslexia not qualifying for an IEP, let's look at that data to see if they could qualify for a 504 on the same data, because they probably will. And that includes time accommodations for our students. So is it okay to know that a student has dyslexia, and you're aware of it, and you're providing the proper remediation, but not have some sort of document that protects that student? No. That's why we do need to have another webcast on 504s and IEPs and appropriate accommodations. Because while we're helping students who have already made it too far in the public school system, they're going to need those supports in order to feel successful in the school and in the classroom. And so that's why it's so important to have that as part of our discussion. Dyslexic students are also often known for their creativity and compensating skills. So strengths such as M strengths that are material reasoning or their 3D spatial reasoning means students with dyslexia often excel at art and music, sports, or subjects requiring material conceptual vision. They are also usually masters at receiving auditory instruction far beyond their grade level. So some great resources on this would be The Dyslexic Advantage by Dr. Brock and Fernet Eady and The Dyslexia Empowerment Plan by Ben Foss. He's a great resource because he's well-educated and accomplished and dyslexic. Teachers must be well trained in how to reach our struggling readers with explicit and systematic instruction that builds sequentially. Teachers must also be taught about dyslexia in order to know how to meet those unique challenges facing students with dyslexia who are learning to read and who need help succeeding in other classes. This understanding will drive instruction and save valuable time and frustration for our students and teachers. Imagine a school where there is a dyslexia expert on staff and this expert is empowered with the rights and responsibilities of educating everyone in the building. Wouldn't that be awesome? And the responsibilities include assembling a team of highly trained reading interventionists who concentrate on the early grades, K through three, to screen and support students at risk of reading difficulties. And their reading intervention should be based on solid research. And they, have, they use good references for all of their information. This is possible. And one of those great references for information that anyone could use in their school to help build a program is Dr. David Kilpatrick's book, Essentials of Assessing, Preventing, and Overcoming Reading Difficulties. It's a great handbook. He gathers together much of this essential research that's gone on in the last decade, and he's distilled it into topic areas that are easy to manage. 
he, he also gives you an uh, assessment of what the characteristics of a good reading program should have. And he, he points out three things. First of all, he tells you three, three key weaknesses of, of readers who are struggling. One is students need to develop good phonic decoding skills. This is essential for helping students make sense of unfamiliar words encountered in text. Poor phonic decoding is a common characteristic of weak readers. That's number one. Number two, weak readers need to develop the capacity to easily remember the words they read. So weak readers have limited sight vocabularies because when they encounter new words, they don't remember them. And weak readers require dozens of exposures to words before they are permanently stored. So this is highly inefficient compared to their typically developing peers. Thus, reading pro progress cannot be accelerated unless readers develop the ability to quickly add words to their sight vocabularies. So this takes time in a systematic program. And then three, once the capacity to efficiently store new words has developed, students require a great deal of reading practice. Only words that have been encountered can be added to one sight vocabulary. Wide exposure to words is necessary to build a sight vocabulary. However, reading practice alone is not an effective way to improve reading skills. I want everybody to remember that one because some programs promote that. If the student is unable to phonically decode unfamiliar words or to remember the words they're be that are being read. So just reading practice alone isn't going to do it. So as we're looking at reading programs, it's good to reference the National Reading Panel. They put out five components or pillars of a good reading program, uh, five skills that a student ought to have. So one is that phonemic awareness that we were talking about. It's the sounds. It's being able to manip manipulate the sounds without looking at the letters. The other one is phonics, and that is actually introducing the letter with the sound and being able to put the sound to the correct letter. And then fluency. Fluent readers are able to read orally with appropriate speed and accuracy and proper expression. And then there's also vocabulary. And the vo vocabulary development is closely connected to comprehension. So that's a key piece that we don't want to miss as well. And the larger the reader's vocabulary, either oral or in print, the easier it is to make sense of the text. That just that should be common sense to us, right? But know that our students who are struggling with reading, of course, that vocabulary isn't going to become because they're not introducing themselves to the text. It just makes sense. And so the vocabulary will need to be a key piece of it, introducing it. And when you're working with students who have a deficit, make sure that vocabulary is a piece that you're working in and always introducing the, the, what do these words mean and giving them context for that. And I like to include also within the vocabulary a little foundational understanding of the English language, which often helps students understand where the meaning comes from for a lot of the words. Comprehension is another one. Comprehension is a complex cognitive process for the reader. It's what they use to understand what they have read. And all of those are key pieces, those five pillars of an essential uh, reading program, components to reading. And then another piece is spelling. So oftentimes we're, I, I hear people say it all the time, oh, I was a poor speller too, or um, you know, I worked at spelling for a long time, I couldn't spell well. Spelling is important. Uh, spelling is a part of that foundational skill, and it should be available to all of our students. If we're using the correct uh, program to teach, we can help our students with spelling. So from all this data and from those th three key things Dr. David Kilpatrick said, how can you judge a good reading program? He gives you three foundational things to look at. Number one, the program aggressively addresses and corrects the student's phonological awareness difficulties and teaches phonological awareness to the advanced level. Number two, the program provides phonic decoding instruction and or reinforcement. And then number three, finally, it provides students with ample opportunities to apply the developing skills by reading connected texts. Three key things in a good reading remediation program. So if this ideal school existed, and if teacher training programs included instruction regarding dyslexia so that every educator had at least some foundational understanding of this number one learning disability, reading outcomes would be very different in the United States. I think it's really hard as educators sometimes because we see our classroom. Either we've been in a fourth grade classroom for years or a fifth grade classroom or we switch between a couple of grades, but it's a pretty limited view of a young student's life or even an older student's life. We didn't see them when they were younger. So we didn't see the full continuum. And that's what I want to offer you with my personal history, my son's own story. I got to see the full continuum of that student. I saw him when he was in kindergarten. I saw him when he was in third grade. I saw him when he was in sixth grade, still struggling with reading. I knew that he was a happy, well-adjusted boy when he wasn't in the classroom. I knew that the minute we approached the classroom door, he became a different young man. It was hard for me not to be able to convey that to his teachers every year. Some were able to get that better than others, and I don't blame them, particularly because it's hard. They didn't get to see him like I saw him. But that's easier for me to understand those students than perhaps another teacher because I've taken that boy home. I know what it's like when they go home and they failed all day with reading. 
I know what it's like to spend another three to four hours on homework when all they want to do is play like other kids and all they want to do is be left alone from having this one skill that isn't coming for them hammered home yet again. Our students are human beings. These are their lives. When they can't read, it changes everything for them. And that's why I cannot convey enough how important this is, reading. Teaching reading appropriately to every student. This would mean no more stumbling across a student in fifth grade who can't remember the vowels in his or her own name, because it happens. No more science quizzes handed in from a 10th grade student who can't remember the word that is spelled with T-H-A-T. And those are all signs of dyslexia in that older student. In other words, no more stumbling across an otherwise very bright student who simply can't spell. And no more shut down behaviors from an otherwise well-adjusted student who thrives in every other setting where reading isn't required. No more watching an intelligent student cut class and claim to be ill every time the teacher wants to read a novel. No. Now that same student knows that he or she can learn with the best of them. These same students have the confidence that no matter what standardized, high-stakes tests are ahead in their future, they can do it because they have the support of the school. The term dyslexia is understood. Peers and teachers acknowledge the need for accommodations and understand how they simply level the playing field because expertise breeds sound knowledge and training. Everyone benefits. The message is clear. Every student, including those with dyslexia, are going to be successful in our school. Now that's a system all of us should consider worth fighting for. Thank you. Thank you, Donnell, for that powerful presentation. Because there were so many questions, hundreds of questions that were submitted about dyslexia, it was impossible for Donnell to ca capture all of her expertise in just that one presentation. We're pleased to announce that Donnell will be doing yet another webcast for us to address dyslexia evaluations, serving students with dyslexia on IEPs and 504 plans, and accommodations including assistive technology and instructional practices that work best for students with print-based disabilities. That presentation will be on Wednesday, January 25th at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. And all of you who have registered will get a reminder email to register for that when the time comes. We now have Donnell here in the office to answer your questions live. Hi, Donnell. Hi. We've had hundreds of questions submitted as people registered. Donnell tried to cover as many of those questions as possible in her presentation, and she's going to ad address a few of those questions now, as well as a few others that were submitted during the presentation. One last note before we begin the question portion, all of the resources she talks about in the presentation, including books and websites that were referenced, will be included in the slides. As long as you registered for the presentation, you'll receive an email as soon as those slides are available. If you did not register, feel free to go register now at readinghorizons.com webcast. And now for the question and answer with Donnell, starting with this question, Donnell. If a student displays repeated reversals in writing, the, parent, the parents think that the child has dyslexia and automatically want the child tested for dyslexia. What is the best approach to answer their concerns? Okay, I'm really glad that someone asked this question because it's a good one. And letter and number reversals are developmental and are common until approximately age seven and sometimes beyond and do not necessarily indicate dyslexia. And this is a perfect example of looking at a variety of indicators to determine if a student is at risk. Start by getting a family history. Remember, family members with reading difficulties, late onset for speech or confused speech sounds, other factors like problems with directionality and learning the alphabet, all of these things you want to consider. And you never want to simply dismiss letter reversals out of hand. Looking at those other attending factors is important. So reassure your parent by being open with them about the other factors you're watching for. I think there's been so much dismissal in the past that parents are ear leery of hearing that wait and see statement or anything that resembles it. And it, I always like to err on the side of helping parents feel validated. So parents who feel empowered with good information can be so helpful to us as educators. Yeah, they can. Next question. How can dyslexia be differentiated from other learning disabilities? What's the difference between dyslexia and reading SLD? Okay, that's another great question. Uh, specific learning disability is one of the 13 classifications under federal special education law. Dyslexia isn't listed separately, although it is the most common of these learning disabilities. Specific learning disabilities also include dysgraphia, which may impact a student's ability to write efficiently, and dyscalculia, which may impact a student's ability to count, measure, estimate, and directly copy numbers and symbols. 
In fact, dyscalculia can impact a student's basic numeracy. My son suffers from dyscalculia. Mm -hmm. A tremendously helpful book is The Number Sense by Stanislas Dehaene. Dehaene is a French neuroscientist who has conducted some fascinating research regarding the brain and its recognition of numbering patterns, as well as reading. And it wasn't until I read this book that I really understood my son's struggle with math. Many students have coexisting conditions, which make it difficult for educators to determine how to best help. One important item to note is that samples of student work, especially over time, can be very valuable as part of the identification process. And many schools and parents are now finding ways to collect that student work. Understanding the brain science behind the learning challenge helps teachers as well to see the patterns in a student's work. Patterns in work production can tell us so much about our students. There's a great deal of information about each of these learning disabilities, and schools will need to establish a process for identifying and supporting students with one or more learning disabilities. The reason for identification and use of the term dyslexia, as recommended by the U.S. Department of Education, is to ensure that students are receiving appropriate targeted instruction and intervention as early as possible. Here's an interesting question about English language learners. This question is, I have a high e he, excuse me, I have a high ELL population in my class. There are times I, can, I am confused between a student with dyslexia issues and student with a language learning barrier. Okay, that's another great question. In fact, we're, I'm running into this a lot at my school currently because I have uh, not only an ELL population that's local, but also our international students who come from different countries, and sometimes they bring with them a learning history that doesn't give you very much information. So this is where a firm understanding of dyslexia can be so valuable. English is a challenging orthography. Orthography refers to the conventions of spelling, and it includes hyphenation, capitalization, word breaks, etc. English is considered an opaque orthography because of the many irregularities in this orthography. Spanish and Italian are considered shallow orthographies because they remain more regular in their spelling conventions. As a result of the challenging orthography, many ELL students may struggle with English if their primary language was a shallow orthography. That being said, the same letter to symbol uh, challenges that interfere with an English first student learning to read with writing and in English will also plague the ELL student. In other words, if you have a firm understanding of dyslexia with an English first student, those same skills will serve you well when discerning if an ELL student has dyslexia. Remember, again, that if you decide to do any formal t uh, testing on that student, it will be necessary to have testing materials available in students' primary language and some resources are the rtinetwork.org. Um, they have a toolkit to help you as well. Now, among our registrants, I know we have a lot of parents who are listening today. Can you share some resources for parents? You bet. In fact, uh, there's just no one good resource for parents. Uh, it may depend on their level of understanding and their experience with dyslexia. But a really good place to start regarding the laws and regulations surrounding dyslexia is Rights Law. It's a free online source with comprehensive information regarding special education law and parent advocacy. The International Dyslexia Association has numerous free resources as well as the informational books that were mentioned in the webcast. And you can find many great parent resources on Amazon or other websites by reading the reviews. There are also a number of websites that can be very helpful for parents. Just to mention a few would be understood.org, that is one. There's also National Center of Learning Disabilities. And for those who are interested in information regarding adults with learning challenges, you can search the National Association for Adults with Special Learning Needs as well. Next question, can we improve RAN, which is Rapid Automatic Naming, through practice, or is that teaching to the test? I think it helps with categorization. Okay, so this is a really good question, and depending on your background, um, let me just give us a foundational understanding first of RAN. So let's agree on a definition of RAN, or Rapid Automized Naming, also referred to as Rapid Naming. RAN refers to the skill of quickly accessing presumably rote information, like numbers, letters, colors, or objects. Students slower than average with RAN typically struggle with word-level reading. And I'm going to refer to Dr. David Kilpatrick's book that was mentioned in the webcast. Again, it's Essentials of Assessing, Preventing, Overcoming Reading Difficulties, because he has a really good rundown of RAN. Dr. Kilpatrick does this really good job of putting RAN in perspective in terms of reading. On page 174 and 75 of the book, he explains that there is no body of research demonstrating that training RAN improves reading, and good RAN does not ensure the development of, of skilled reading. He also notes that the precise relationship between RAN and reading continues to be a source of uncertainty. 
However, he adds that several studies have demonstrated improvements in RAN following phonological awareness training and substantial improvements in reading. So he concludes, while RAN is something that we should assess for its apparent relationship to reading, it is not something we should address instructionally. Interesting. That's interesting. You mentioned the reading program you use at your school. What is the program and how is it helpful in identifying and supporting students with dyslexia? Okay, great. Well, it's Reading Horizons, as you see. At AISU, we are implementing their method. And since we are a public charter school with grades K through 12, including ELLs, and roughly 60 international students, we have the ideal setting for a full implementation strategy. So in grades K through 5, we are using the Reading Horizons method as Tier 1 or general classroom instruction, as well as Tier 2 or small group instruction. In the middle and high schools, we are using Reading Horizons to drive reading remediation for students who have scored at least three grade levels below in reading. We use Reading Horizons to drive the ELL and international English instruction as well. This type of implementation plan means our students are receiving the same reinforcing instruction at all levels and throughout the grades. The Reading Horizons system is based on that understanding of Orton-Gillingham. The highly structured program introduced this idea of breaking reading and spelling down into smaller skills involving letters and sounds and then building on these skills over time. It also pioneered the multi-sensory approach to teaching reading, which is considered the gold standard for teaching students with dyslexia. This means that instructors are sight, hearing, touch, and using uh, the sight, the hearing, the touch, and the movement to help students connect language with letters and words. Reading Horizons is based on this understanding, this OG method, and has developed a unique and rather elegant marking system that is helpful in proving words or making word decoding visible to our students. We are also focusing on our K-3 to students in order to make sure we are identifying possible language-based learning challenges that should be addressed early in an effort to help students avoid reading challenges that can be addressed with solid early reading instruction and intervention. All of this means planning, coordinating, and training that involves not just the literacy staff who are trained reading paras, but also the general education teachers who become the first line of identification for students. We hope that over time, as we become better versed in the Reading Horizons program and more familiar with the reading system, that our entire school, from general education teachers to more specialized educators, will feel well versed in how to help identify and recommend, if necessary, a student for additional support. When the multi-tiered system of support that we know well in education is well organized and everyone is trained in not only the MTSS protocol, but also in the appropriate interventions, then schools can finally begin to get a handle on the atrocious reading scores that have become a hallmark of the American education system. That is true, they have. Um, and one, one final question, and we heard various iterations of this question a number of times in our, in our question section. What are interventions and accommodations that can be used for students with dyslexia? Okay, this is huge, and I'm, again, <laughs> really glad we have the question, and in fact, has, has spurred us on to another webcast, um, which I hope uh, viewers who, who watched the webcast today, and certainly the first one too, this third webcast will be very important because it takes us to that next step. Now we've identified, we have a good understanding of the dyslexia, now what do we do? And that's the next question. We've received so many requests for specifics on evaluating students and providing adequate instruction intervention that I'll be focusing on these specifics in the next webcast, Dyslexia Part 2. And that webcast will be live streamed on Wednesday, January 25th, 6 p.m. Eastern Time. And you can register for that webcast if you're interested in more information about classroom instruction, IEPs, and 504 plans and intervention strategies. Wow, thank you so much, Donald. We're so grateful to have you, have you here with us, to share all your knowledge with us, and we'll be grateful to have you again in January for that next webcast. Um, for now, we're going to share a short review of what the Reading Horizons method looks like. Students are empowered by learning the core framework of the Reading Horizons method. The 42 sounds in the English language are sequentially taught beginning with the 26 letters of the alphabet. Students are then taught to blend each sound together which allows them to read an increasing number of words. To determine the vowel sounds within a word, students learn the five phonetic skills. These skills teach students how to identify whether a vowel should be short or long based on specific letter patterns that follow the vowel. Phonetic skills one and two teach patterns that determine when a vowel is pronounced with its short sound. Phonetic skills three, four, and five teach patterns that determine whether a vowel is pronounced with its long sound. Once students have mastered the five phonetic skills, they're taught two decoding skills, which help them to know how to separate words into syllables. 
students can then apply what they have learned about the 42 sounds and five phonetic skills to each syllable. Thanks again to Donnell for her wonderful presentation, and thank you all for joining us today. For any questions about the Reading Horizons program, please contact us at 1-800-333-0054 or visit our website at readinghorizons.com. You can fill out the Talk to a Specialist form and schedule a full demo. As a final reminder, Donnell's next webcast will be Wednesday, January 25th at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. And in that webcast, she will focus on dyslexia evaluations, serving students with dyslexia on IEPs and 504 plans, and accommodations, including assistive technology and instructional practices that work best for students with print-based disabilities. If you want a reminder of that event, be sure to find Reading Horizons on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, where we'll post all that information as well as other great content. If you registered for this webcast, you'll receive an email with the presentation, the slide deck with all that great information, and you'll be able to request a certificate of attendance. While you're there, you can also watch Donnell's previous webcast, Teaching Reading, the Number One Job of Every Educator. Thank you again, Donnell, and to everyone who is with us today. Find us on your favorite social media and visit readinghorizons.com for more information about how we help schools address their literacy needs. Have a wonderful day.